As some of our previous episodes demonstrate, people kill for many reasons. In times of war, ordinary individuals kill because their government demands it. Sometimes doctors kill people, both on purpose and accidentally. And of course, some people kill just because it's fun. But when murder becomes profitable, sometimes the urge to kill is too tempting to ignore. The Burke and Hare murders in 1828 were the perfect intersection between corrupt systems and corrupt people. Scotland Corpse Shortage If you wanted to become a surgeon in the early 19th century, then you really needed to study anatomy. To view the human body in excruciating detail, you needed to take a course where human bodies were dissected. Understandably, if medical proficiency was your goal, then you wanted to take your anatomy course at a prestigious university. Perhaps the most well-known place for learning the fine art of cutting cadavers open was the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, Scotland. Providing a sufficient supply of corpses to the college was a problem. As more students arrived and more well-known surgeons began teaching, the demand for bodies increased. The college was willing to pay for specimens, provided nobody broke the law in acquiring them. The law was restrictive concerning how doctors could acquire the dead volunteers. Only those who died in prison, committing suicide, or were abandoned orphans could be taken legally. It eliminated most of those who died from eligibility. Scottish law also had a gaping loophole that many less scrupulous individuals were willing to exploit. It was a criminal offense to take property from the dead. And it was also a criminal offense to disturb a grave. But it was not illegal to steal a corpse because technically it didn't belong to anyone. Grave robbing became a very lucrative career for some time. To try and deter it, families began using creative solutions to bury their loved ones. Some would put heavy objects on top of the grave to discourage retrieving the body beneath. In other cases, the deceased would be placed in a heavy iron cage. Sometimes guards would be hired to watch over the grave until enough time passed that the corpse was no longer useful to surgeons. Countermeasures against the grave robbers were mostly successful. It reduced the supply of corpses to the college, which created a crisis for the anatomy program. The prices for cadavers rose as well. They ranged from 800 to 1,000 in US dollars, or 621 and 776 British pounds, depending on the season. In the warm months, bodies were worth less because they decomposed faster. It was only a matter of time until someone realized that the best way to acquire corpses was to kill the living. Knox, Burke, and Hare Robert Knox attended school in Edinburgh and became a doctor in 1814. Those who met him usually didn't have a problem remembering his appearance. Knox caught smallpox as a child, which left him blind in one eye and also created several facial deformities. Knox began his medical career with service in the army. First, he served at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. In 1819, he provided medical services in South Africa. Robert Knox returned to Edinburgh in 1820. In 1825, he became a fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons. Knox lectured on anatomy and performed two dissections per day. His classes were usually full of observers. Knox became perhaps the most well-known anatomy lecturer in Western medicine. Unpleasant though the practice might be, the study of human anatomy was necessary for the field of surgery to advance. William Burke came from a much different background than Knox. Burke was born in Ireland in 1792. He joined the British Army and served for a few years before finally settling down with the woman he married. The marriage didn't last long. Burke had an argument with his father-in-law over land ownership, so he deserted his wife and family and moved to Scotland. He was a laborer and eventually met Helen MacDougall, who became his second wife. They moved near Edinburgh in 1827, where William Burke earned a living making and fixing shoes. Burke was known locally to be hard-working with a great sense of humor. He would often sing and dance to entertain potential clients. For a brief time in 1827, Burke and his new wife traveled to work on harvesting crops. 
There they met William Hare, who was probably a few years younger than Burke. Hare was supposedly very lean with lots of scars. He reportedly had quite a temper. When in Edinburgh, Hare lived at a lodging house of a man named Logue and his wife, Margaret Laird. Logue died in 1826. Hare married Margaret and also took possession of the house. William Burke and William Hare became fast friends. When the harvest was over, both couples decided to live in Burke's lodging house in Edinburgh. The two couples drank a lot and soon gained a reputation. As usually happens with heavy drinkers, they also started having money problems. A Gentle Start Hare was able to maintain his lifestyle and Burke's as well by renting out rooms. This plan didn't work out too well when tenants died before paying. On November 29, 1827, a lodger named Donald died before receiving his military pension. The exact cause isn't known, but it was probably heart failure. Being dead, though, meant there would be no pension payment. No pension payment meant that Hare wouldn't get paid. Burke and Hare decided to sell Donald's corpse for profit. The local parish provided a coffin for Donald's burial. Burke and Hare hid the body under a bed and filled the coffin with straw. After it was removed for burial, the two men put their plan into action. They carried Donald's body to Edinburgh University and started looking for someone who wanted to purchase it. They were eventually directed to Robert Knox. The transaction was mostly handled by assistants, although Knox did set the price. After the sale, and as Burke and Hare were leaving, one of the young anatomists supposedly said they would be glad to see them again when they had another to dispose of. They would make sure to have more bodies to dispose of. A lot more. Drinking Responsibly In January or February 1828, a man named Joseph was lodging in Hare's house. Joseph was suffering with a fever and had become delirious. Hare and his wife were worried that having someone that sick in the house could be bad for business. Hare asked Burke to help him with correcting this issue. They provided Joseph with a lot of whiskey. Then, while he was sleeping, Burke laid on top of Joseph's torso to immobilize him. Hare then suffocated Joseph to death. They took the body to Knox, who gladly paid them for the delivery. The order of the victims isn't entirely clear, but some sources think the next was an unnamed man who paid Burke to lodge at the house. The unnamed lodger was a traveling salesman who sold matches and tender. While staying at Hare's house, he became ill with jaundice. Hare and Burke were again concerned that someone being sick might affect business. So they solved the problem the same way as before and suffocated the man to death. Then they sold the remains to Knox. Abigail Simpson was an older woman who supplemented her income by selling salt. On February 12th, she was invited to Burke's house and given so much alcohol that she couldn't return home. Once she lost consciousness, Hare put something on top of her face to slowly suffocate her. When delivering the corpse to Knox, he complimented the pair on how fresh the body was. In early April, Burke met two women named Mary Patterson and Janet Brown. He invited them back to his house to drink, of course. Patterson passed out. Burke's wife arrived and began accusing Burke of having an affair with Brown. Janet Brown left, leaving Mary Patterson passed out on the table. Hare and Burke murdered Patterson in her sleep. When they delivered the body to Knox, he was delighted with the condition of the corpse. He stored it in whiskey for three months before dissecting it. At some point in the middle of 1828, a woman named Mrs. Haldane lodged at Hare's house. She became drunk and fell asleep in the stable. As you can probably guess, she was smothered and sold to Robert Knox. Haldane's daughter also lodged at the house several months later. She was also killed, sold, and shortly thereafter dissected. Several more women were killed in the same manner. As bad as this was, it progressed into something even worse. In June, an old woman and her grandson lodged at Hare's house. While the boy sat by the fire, they killed the old woman. Then they killed the boy as well. The final victim was in June. Margaret Dockety was a middle-aged Irish woman. Burke had moved to his cousin's house a few weeks earlier and lured her there. 
Burke also had two other lodgers, Anne and James Gray, staying there too. He paid them to go stay at Hare's house because it was hard to murder people with witnesses hanging around. After the Grays left, Hare and Burke murdered Margaret and put her body under a pile of straw at the end of the bed. The next morning, Anne Gray returned wanting to get some stockings she left in her old room. She became suspicious when she wasn't allowed near it. In the early evening, Anne and James were alone in the house and went to look for themselves. They found Margaret's body and quickly told the police. Knowing that the police were coming, Burke and Hare took the body to Knox. The next morning, the police went to visit Knox. James Gray identified the body of Margaret Doherty. On November 3rd, an arrest warrant was finally issued for Burke, Hare, and their wives. Reality Bites In total, Burke and Hare killed 16 people. But the way they did it made it difficult to prove it was murder. After examining Margaret's body, though, it was concluded suffocation was probable, and that was good enough to charge the pair for murder. The police also spoke to Knox, wondering how he was unaware of the murders. Knox claimed that he was told that Burke and Hare watched poor lodging houses and purchased the dead before anybody else did. The police thought Knox was immoral, but didn't actually murder anyone. Another issue for the police was the bodies were all gone, except for the most recent victim. Since they were dissected in anatomy classes, nobody could actually examine the remains. There was no doubt that Burke and Hare murdered people, but proving it was difficult. The police decided to try a common technique at the time. If even one person could be convinced to confess, that could be used to convince other participants. William Hare was chosen and offered full immunity for both himself and his wife if he would testify. Hare agreed and three murder charges were filed against William Burke and his wife Mary McDougall. Knox was not charged, but the public believed he was complicit. The following rhyme became popular in Edinburgh in 1828. Up the close in Doon the Stair, but in Ben where Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, Knox the boy that buys the beef. The Trial and Aftermath The trial began on Christmas Eve, 1828. It ran through the entire day and into Christmas morning. The final verdict was guilty for Burke and not proven for his wife Mary. Under Scottish law, not proven means the jury thinks the person is probably guilty, but that the prosecution didn't prove it. William Burke was sentenced to death. When rendering the sentence, the judge said the following to Burke. Your body should be publicly dissected and anatomized, and I trust that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved, in order that posterity may keep in remembrance your atrocious crimes. Mary McDougall was released at the end of the trial and returned home. But when she went to the store to buy whiskey, she was confronted by an angry mob. The mob was not happy about her not proven verdict. Mary was taken to the police station for safety. The mob laid siege to it, and she was forced to escape out the back. She left Edinburgh the next day, and history doesn't record what happened to her after that. Margaret Hare also decided it was better to not stay in Scotland. While she was in Glasgow waiting for a ship, she was attacked by a mob. The police protected her long enough to escort her to a ship bound for Ireland. Nobody knows what happened to her after that. William Hare left Scotland too, but on foot. The police took him out of town after an angry mob attacked him. They pointed him in the direction of the English border and suggested he go in that direction. Nobody knows what happened after that. On January 28, 1829, William Burke was hanged. A very large crowd showed up for the event. Some estimates state that over 25,000 people were in attendance. On February 1st, his corpse was dissected by Professor Monroe. During the procedure, Monroe dipped his quill into Burke's blood and wrote, This is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. Burke's skeleton was given to the Anatomical Museum of the Edinburgh Medical School. It is still there today. Robert Knox had to leave Edinburgh after the locals began burning an effigy of him. 
He continued practicing medicine in England until his death in 1862. William Burke and William Hare raise interesting questions about addiction, poverty, and morality. Neither man was wealthy, and they both drank to excess daily. But did they murder because they were inherently bad people? Or was their judgment simply impaired from alcohol abuse? The fact that they targeted sick men and drunk elderly women certainly suggests they knew what they were doing. And we can never know what role their wives really played in the endeavor. However, it really happened. And there is one very clear lesson to be learned. Be very careful who you drink with. Was it just pure capitalism? Or just pure evil? You decide. And thank you for watching Bad Things in History.